Welcome everyone. My name's Hugh McCarthy. I'm a free flight coach, tracking coach, and tunnel coach. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about roadmap from AFF to real rock and roller. Now, everyone gets on social media and sees these videos and they see all of these amazing things that happen and they don't exactly know how to get from where they are to where, where they want to be. And I get to ask that question all the time. Now, if I can do it, you can do it. It's one of those, like, this is a simple bouncing ball. It's how much time, money, and effort you want to spend to get there in the end. Um, it's a little bit about me. I've been basically cut away from real life in about 2014 and started doing this full time. Uh, I like competing in indoor and outdoor. And then for the last couple of years, I've been becoming into the judging world because uh, I spent too much time and money. So it's a little bit like taking a step back from competing and seeing to the next level of part of the organization. Uh, today, this is how we're going to go from AFF all the way through to about a thousand jumps. Once you've got a thousand jumps, you should be starting to take care of your own progression and life path there. Now, is it going to instantly play? This guy, Matt Munting, did this a few years ago. When I say a few, it's about 10 years ago now. Um, and I still think it's very prevalent. So we're going to listen to Matt for seven minutes, and then uh, we'll continue on. OK, listen up, folks. This is the universal ego skill skydiving matrix. This is everything you need to know about who you want to hang out with when you go down the drop zone who you want to jump with and who you want to be. Now right here, this is a graph. Okay, so everyone knows that our graph has two axes. We got one axis down here, we got one axis over there, boom, boom. Okay, right here, down here is our skill axis. Okay, over here we've got our ego axis. Cool? <laughs> now everyone knows our skill axis is measured from zero to ten. Okay, whereas over here, as skydivers, we measure our ego axis from 4 to 10. Now, the reason we start at 4 is because everyone knows there ain't a skydiver out there with an ego less than a 4. <laughs> no good. All right. Now, as we go across here, we've got our ego skill line. Okay, it's important to keep referencing back to this line. You don't want to be above that line at any time. Right, now I'm going to start off with our first section. It starts with everyone that is below a five skill. We draw a line up there. This is your no-go zone. No-go zone. These are the people. We don't jump with them. We don't fly with them. We don't take any coaching tips from people in this zone. We stay away from these people. It's just it. Life is better that way. This is the no-go zone. Stay out of it. If you find yourself in it, get out of it. All right. So now we're going to do another little section here from skill, skill level of five to eight and all the way up to that ego skill line. We've got our fun jump zone or fun zone. Cool? This is the time we're jumping around, we're having fun with our friends. We've got above a five skill level. People can bear to jump with us. It's, uh, it's good times in this zone, but bear in mind this is not a static zone. We're trying to get out of this zone, so keep pushing hard, don't stay in it, don't get lazy. That's the fun jump zone. All right, so we're going to move on up here. Remember we've got our ego skill line. We're going to go above this line. This is your danger zone. Unfortunately, we don't want to end up in this zone and we don't want to hang around with people in this zone. These are your ground generals, your tunnel rats, the ones that don't skydive. These are your redheads and uh, anyone with the name Robbie. This is where your shit gets taken off you for the day. They ground you and the fun stops. These are the people you don't want to hang out with. And these are definitely the place you don't want to end up. Cool? Now, while I'm here, I'm going to stop and just mention that this is not a static environment, OK? Once you've located a person, 
in one of these zones, they can just up and vanish into another zone at any time, any time. So this is like a dope chart. What we want to do is keep referencing back to this matrix, using it, correlating data, reliable data, to, to get a, a cluster of points, and then we can use that again to relocate the person in any other zone. Cool? All right, so what we've got here is below uh, around about a seven ego, but above an eight skill, we've got a zone here that we like to call the boogie zone. Yeah, this is where we've moved up in the world, we're starting to get our skills, we've moved on to go on to boogies. These people you want to hang out with, you have some you know, parties after the drop zone. You, you don't mind being around these people. Their ego's not too bad. They're good to jump with. They're good to hang out with. And it's a good place to be the boogie zone. So once you get there, you're reasonably happy, but you're always wanting to push on. And the only way you can push on is if we move down uh, and drop our ego between a seven and a five ego. We're going to find a zone here called the organizer coach zone. This is a good place to be. Uh, this is where we want to, everyone aspires to get to. And these are the guys you want to hang out with. When you see them, you want to start flinging cash at them. You want to start giving them money so you can learn from them. These are the people you want to kick it with, go out with, jump with, everything. This is where you can stop. You'd be happy stopping there, most people do. There we go. So now, <clears throat> below a five ego, uh, in between a five and a four ego, and above an eight skill, this is a very rare zone. This is what we like to call the cooter zone. Once we get to the cooter zone, <coughs> which most of you probably won't, uh, if you do find someone in the cooter zone, you want to fly with them safely, you want to protect them, you want to bring them back to us so we can study them so we can replicate them. You'll probably find them running around the drop zone, screaming head up for days, uh, getting down, having a good time. That's the CUDA zone, very rare. Look after them, fly with them safely. So I was, I was explaining this to a mate down at the drop zone the other day, drawing it up, showing him the graph, everything. And he goes, hang on a second. He's like, mate, I met someone the other day that was easily a nine skill nine skill and below a four ego. He's like, what? you saying below a four ego? <clears throat> what, like a nine skill to a two or three ego? Yeah, yeah, I have. I'm learning a lot from them. And I'm like, mate, you got to be kidding. You're talking to a kid. That's Mini Mac term down here. Got their own little section. You're never going to get to where they're at. Uh, but you can try. Uh, they're always willing to offer a tip. Uh, but yeah, that's a kid. All right, so that's the universal ego skill skydiving matrix. I hope you've enjoyed the chat. Uh, <clears throat> hope it helps you down the drop zone. Remember, stay out of the danger zone. Get the hell out of the no-go zone. If you find yourself in there, get down the tunnel and learn. Cool? Uh, that's it. And when you get to the cooter zone, have a good time. <laughs> See ya. Right. Okay, uh, listen. There we go. So, I started like everyone else from AFF, and these were my cooters. So it was like, these are the guys that I met when I had 50 jumps, and I kept looking up to them and getting coaching off them and seeing how far we can go. And all of these guys are still in the sport, so they've been doing it for more than 20 years sort of thing. So if you guys want to have a look at, take a photo of that and research them, you'll get more knowledge than I can give you because I got my knowledge from them. Any British cases? This one is. So uh, Pete is English, lives in Spain, Danish, uh, Norwegian, Australian, UK, and Swiss. So, uh, 
if you don't know who Pete Allen is, he's got 35,000 skydives and he's done everything. He's been winning championships since 1986. Martin revolutionized freestyle skydiving. Mox was uh, the first free fly base and the pushes and he's been a free fly champion twice. Mason's the top flyer in Australia. Elisa's the local legend that's doing the big race stuff this year and winning national championships for 2A Dynamic two years in a row now. And Philip is one of the fundamentals of low speed tunnel coaching. So it's one of those people that I constantly go back to to find information from. This is the progression tree written by British Skydiving. I've loosely blazed off my speech off this with the extra bits that I should say, but I have not gone into any of the instructing side because that's not my killer fish. I'm all about fun jumping. So, AFF to A license. You just have to survive. <laughs> Get out of the plane, practice what you've been taught, practice your pull, land safely. Book yourself a packing course, because if you're jumping it, you can pack it. It's very simple. If I can pack it, you guys can learn how to pack. Along this point, you should be getting into some tunnel flying, especially in our weather-based weather country. You can get in, learn all of the skills you need to, and start sharing. So you can get up to the point where you can start sharing four-way. And the thing about tunnel is it instantly becomes cheaper as soon as you can start sharing. So if you can get to that point at this level, then the next part of your journey will be even easier. The UK is starting to get some really good scrambles events going on. So we have the Altitude Brothers and the FAB events. So everyone's constantly out there looking for people to join their events. So head along and find some friends that you probably wouldn't have met and start joining in. Now we're heading from our A license to our B license. This is where you start pack, learn a, a canopy course, because skydiving is two parts. Tunnel flying doesn't make you a better skydiver. You need to work on your skydiving and your canopy. And it works towards getting your CT1 signed off. The generic house rules of getting your jump master signed off. And so all of those base level skill sets of becoming a proficient skydiver. And then start working on your FS. Now, often on the Facebook group pages, you'll see someone saying, oh, I'm looking for a coach for Saturday morning on Friday afternoon. It's like, who's available? It's like you, everyone knows who they are. There's a list of them. So find a coach and use them as a mentor and make a plan. So work between the both of you, what weekends you can do, every, like make out a couple of weeks of jumping plan that you're going to do, and that makes everything smoother and progression faster. And then do it until that coach can say, hey, Martin, can you just join this four-way? This guy needs his FS1 done. And you go, yeah, sure, mate. Like, where do you need me? That's how it should feel. If you don't feel like you can, if you're going to ruin someone's four-way, then you probably shouldn't have your FS1. That's your thought process. So keep doing it until you can feel comfortable to jump with anyone. And this is where all the fundamentals of your skydiving will be built from. Getting on the plane, exiting with multiple people, getting to the base, tracking away from at the end, keeping alive, flying in the formation before you land on the ground. All of the steps are built from your belly. And by this point, you should have your packing certificate. If you've got enough money to keep paying for packing, you still should be able to pack your own stuff, even though you pay someone else to do it on those big days. All right, 50 to 100 jumps. That's where it starts to become fun. You start to actually start to participate with your friends. Find a rookie team, so three other friends, and your, hopefully your FS mentor will either be an FS four-way coach or can point you towards one and then start working that way as a rookie team. It's building those fundamentals of turning up on time, getting on the load, all of the bits that just make you a better skydiver are easily built and you build some camaraderie and a reason to go to the drop zone. Off the back of your canopy course, you should be also consolidating all of those skills to keep you alive and landing and safe and progressing the other part of your skydiving. If you can't pack a rig for someone else to jump, 
because you're a little bit scared of what you think your packing job's like, you should be better at packing. You should go find a packer and be, get them to help you get to a point if you can pack anyone's rig and send it on its way. I think you've got been bitten by the bug as well by this point, and this is where you can start buying some kit. The first kit you'll buy will be ruined because you will just dump it into the ground. It's a learning phase. So buy off second hand, second, buy second hand off Facebook Marketplace because skydivers hoard skydiving kit, and if you ask it, I can guarantee you someone's got a spare helmet or jumpsuits they don't use anymore. I know I've got too much stuff in my cupboard that I need to get rid of, and just buy some kit. Uh, Long-term rig hire, because that's the big expense for getting into this sport by yourself, is a great idea because it can help you with your downsizing and your rig selection and what you want to do as you move forward. And hopefully by this point, there's a boogie somewhere, even if that's abroad, if not inside the UK, and it sort of widens your knowledge of not the small pond syndrome of your own drop zone. You sort of start to see how the rest of the world skydives and gets along. Now, 100 to 200 jumps. Continuation on bigger belly and bigger formations. If you can't do an eight-way speed star comfortably, then you probably shouldn't be on an eight-way tracking jump. So it's like if you can't get to a base that's just holding still or there's too much going on, there's too many people or there's too many canopies in the air, you shouldn't be doing more advanced skydiving if you can't do that skydiving on your belly in the basis form of it. You can stay here and continue that way as long as you want, or you can start to learn to fly your body and move into the free fly world. Learning to fly in the tunnel and use your body teaches you that free fall component. And then you take those free fall skills that you've learned in a wind tunnel and you put them into the sky. Because you're only learning how to balance and use your body in a 45 second skydive. That's the whole point of tunnel making it so much quicker and easier and then you just put it into the sky. British skydiving have made it black and white of what you need to be able to do to achieve your sticker. And there's a book that says the whole thing. So if you don't read the book to know what's expected of you, to then be able to have a better conversation with the coach and the mentor that you're asking, then you're like limiting your ability to ask better questions. So it's black and white, the skills you need to be able to achieve. Read them, understand what you need to be able to do, and then have a better conversation with the same met method of build a relationship, make a progress plan, and plan out the first few months of your summer of how you're going to get your sticker. You're going to earn your sticker. So earning your sticker is a big thing for me because it's just like a license. It's only a license. It's really a license to kill your friends because if you just sort of like, we all know <coughs> coaches that will just please you and give a coach sticker out. If you got that and you go skydiving with someone, you don't have the skills get required, it's only making it dangerous for your friends. So you should be, by reading the book, know what you need to achieve, achieve them. And if you don't, just spend more time and money until you do. Just keep yourself safe and progressing. You don't want to be that guy that's in the danger zone. Uh, and then alongside of getting good at it, don't go, all right, got my sticker, boom, next discipline. What am I going to do now? There's a levels of getting good at that discipline that you've just earned the sticker to. Like you're current in that certain bit, so continue that way. At this point, I think you're deep enough to buy your own rig. Go get some proper advice from a rigger. I still go to Josh, my rigger, now. Hey, mate, what should I do with this? How should I do with this? Because that's not my specialty. The prime example is that those guys that sat in this room before us that went 10 minutes over, they're still talking about packing. And it's the same thing they've been packing for how many years. So those guys are the special, specialists at it. Ask them about how you should get your own stuff. Cool. So we're moving on now. Belly flying can be done for your entire skydiving career. So if you want to stay there, go all the way to the AAA dive pool and try and beat NFTO, then that's quite as happy. 
or you can start moving now because you've done your tracking, you can move and start flying your body. So in 2024, tunnel flying is how you learn to fly your body and then you put those skills into the sky. You need both of the skill sets, but if you're trying to learn to balance in the sky, it just will take you more time and money than it would be to learn your fly your body in the wind tunnel first and then take it to the sky. It's just proven these days. Along the same lines, hopefully your tracking coach is a free fly coach as well. You can stick to that same relationship or use a different coach to get different information because if everyone's got the rating, then someone has thought that they've got enough information to share. So get as much information from as many coaches as possible. And with you having your own knowledge of reading the manual or enough knowledge of talking to people, you'll be able to de decipher if a coach has got the right information for you or not. At the same point, getting steeper and working on towards TR3, getting further into the tracking world of moving on will help you. And then do another canopy course. This will probably be the next stage of gaining speed or the next flight one course as it moves along, progressing that skill set as well. Once you've got proficient on your feet and you're happy and you can do all of that and you've earned your FF1 and you've practiced it and you feel comfortable, then you can move to flying on your head. This will help you, again, I go on the same process of if you learn to fly in the wind tunnel and learn how to do it properly and all the correct balancing, it's much quicker than the old school method of someone dragging you out on your head and going, I really hope you enjoyed this jump, <laughs> and it's over. Read the manual, earn it until you know what you have to do. It's the same process through the whole thing. And with this skill set, it'll help you learn the transitions through the vertical for TR3. So having control past 45 in both your belly and your back, and then be able to stop in the center. So it's a matter of joining all of those skill sets together, vertical and tracking, to have a skill set you can do all of the motions and movements. And then you just keep doing all of it. Just keep practicing, keep going. Mix up your time between tracking and free fly and working on everything of your skill set. Keep researching, moving further and further down the hole. And then you get caught in the Dunning-Kruger effect. So you think you're a rock star, but really you're here. The peak of Mount Stupid. And then it takes another 10 years of going until you get to that end. With these skydives getting to this high level, it gets more and more dangerous. So if you have time off, you will have skill fade. So every year as you go back, like my first weekend back at jumping, I never do any coaching or load organizing. It's me going jumping with my friends, and I just have some fun, no responsibilities, get current again, because that's not fair to be trying to coach someone. You're like, oh, I haven't done this for three months. Like, I haven't jumped since. November, and I just have taken a couple of months off, so I'm going to take a full weekend for myself when we go back. Along the way, you need to expand your knowledge. If you attend skill camps all over the world, you get more knowledge than the local DZ can give you because certain drop zones run certain special events or people specialize. So if you want to go down a certain way, Everyone knows how to use their phone to find someone who coaches something especially. Find that person and see where they are and attend their skill camps. I've done a few of these, the uh, leading workshops, Zooms online, especially through lockdown as well. I did think I did two through lockdown as well, where we just sat and chat for two days about how we're leading an angle and all of the safety requirements and everything that can be a part of that one discipline. And they're just, you can do that at any point because it's just more knowledge. You'll know what your load organizer will be doing or anything. It's no, you don't have to get to a load, level, load, load organizer level to do these. This is what creates good load organizers. Attending boogies, especially if you go and see other completely different countries, go do something in America, go do something in Spain, go somewhere that is not the UK to see that it can be done everywhere and that you'll come back with appreciation for kit checks or 
things. You'll always learn something from a completely different culture of skydiving. It also makes you realize that the small pond of wherever you are, is everywhere in the world has got some bigger fish doing it better, bigger or better or everything of the sort. I've always enjoyed being in teams because it always puts the repetitive pressure to learn a skill and perform on cue. So you do that point of like, we're going to practice this move for freestyle. So Ryan Arkell and I were in a team for a year as a freestyle team. So it was like we did one routine. We did worked on, worked on certain skills until you got it perfect. And then if you wonder how guys like um, Ewan, famous photographers, can end up in the right spot, it's because Ewan was a photographer for um, QFX, a VFS team, for years. They drilled their skill set to then apply that to their fun jumping. It's just a, a transferable skill. Control your ego. I took my nephew into iFly when I was over back in Australia, and my mum said to her friend, oh, we're going for an iFly experience. That was it. Like, so if I have to explain to my mum what I do for a living, that's about as big as your ego can get. Like, that's as much as, if I was a skateboard coach, she might know what that is. That's how small and niche our world is. So it's, no one cares. Once you can fly on your head, you're like, that's good for you, mate. <laughs> um, we all come from AFF and all different likes of, likes of walks of life. Treat everyone with respect. That's how it works. Doesn't care how many jumps you've got or what you do. Just treat everyone. Uh, when you get to that load organizer level and you set the standard and you make sure if it's a walk-up event, you have to make sure everyone's included. You don't smoke a jump down and leave someone behind as the purpose. We've all seen people go from AFF to Rockstar in a couple of years. Don't judge yourself against them. You don't know how much time and effort they put into getting as good as they have, and they don't especially post everything they went through on their social media, because that's their highlight reel. So just make sure that you make, like, you will have your own battles and your own progress, and you just keep working along. Like, there's no race. It was here before you, and will be here after you. Just enjoy your time as you're progressing through. because we're all good at budgeting, right? Uh, consistent spending at the right level will make your progression faster. Work out how much tunnel you want to do, how many jumps you want to do, and you just keep plodding along. If you blow your budget and then have to take three months off because you need to work some money up to do the next bit, the skill fade will neglect the progression that you made it's this point of just plot along, keep doing as much as you can. If you're happy to spend that money, then you're not worried about spending that money that will affect the learning. You're like, oh, I probably should have paid for something with this money. Then it ruins the experience of the learning and creates more pressure. Uh, I worked with a student. I'm quite open about money and talking about it because that's what this job takes. And I did not realize he was buying all the tunnel time on his credit card to the point where he didn't answer me back at one point. I was like, oh, mate, you're right. And he goes, yeah, I didn't have any of that money. I just now have 15 grand of, tunnel of uh, credit card debt. That was when we sort of like, he's like, yeah, I've got to take some time off now. And that was it. He was out of the sport. He was like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. And I didn't know any of it. So I'm really careful to talk about this to be, it's only tunnel flying. Don't spend money you don't have at it because it's only a skill set. Uh, booking weekends with the partners and kids and then booking skydiving weekends, it's what keeps you in the sport. It's that point of like, if you book those weekends, then you can feel less guilty when you're having fun at the drop zone by yourself, and it doesn't matter. And you keep everyone a part of your world happy, and you'll stay in for longer. So the, the average lifespan of a skydiver is about five to seven years because they sink in too far don't find the right tribe or what they're looking for, and then go back to whatever their life was before. So if you keep it all entwined, and you can just keep going through, it's like I've been in 10 years now without, I'm just, just going to keep doing it. 
And uh, as boring as your friends and family who don't skive are, they are important. I was not forced to write that. <laughs> now, skydive athletes, like we all think we are. Pigeons don't fly very well or far. If your part-time hobby is watching TV or sitting on the couch, and then you want to control yourself in a three-dimensional space and do all the cool things you see on the video, those two skill sets don't line up. So you've got to get out and get active. These skills here, internal, external rotation of your hips, great for sit flying. Hip isolation drills, being able to be able to move your hips, which is your core, in control and under tension, makes all of your skydiving better. Limb isolation, so be able to move your shoulder or your elbow with control, be able to move something gently without the whole body having to move, helps you. Thorac mobility, this half of your spine. We spend all of our life leaning forward, working on either laptops or driving or doing something. So to be able to open this half of your chest and lean back helps with all of your back flying and everything of the sort that's going to be the next steps of your career of skydiving. Your shoulder strength and your rear delts, again with sit flying and head down, extended arms pushing up and down. So the wind's either pushing this way, so you need to be able to lift up, or the wind's pushing this way, and you need to be able to push down. So it's a matter of being able to work with an extended arm. And working in the mirror, so when you're upside down, the whole world goes back to front. Right is right, right is left, and left is right, and up and left is down. So you need to spend time hung upside down. And it's one thing, if you feel challenged by that, some people pick it up really well. They go, oh, it's just back to front, it's quite easy. Other people, the whole world goes blind on them. So if you know that's a thing for you, hang upside down on your couch, look backwards, play ball sports, do any activity that puts you under some level of stress whilst trying to work in the mirrored. And then when you come to spend time in the wind tunnel or learning to spend time on your head in the sky, that stress is gone. You already know how to work in the mirrored. More on the physical. Normal flight times in a wind tunnel is two and a half minute rotations. So if you can't do move your hips for more than 30 seconds, then uh, I do work on some of your endurance. Everything you've got from lift, run, dodge, mobility, movement. If you watch all the high end, end tunnel flyers, bounce around the wind tunnel, they're using their entire body going backwards and forwards, so it's all a part of it. Proprioceptive ability, to so be able to know where your hand is when you're back here. My wife won't agree with this, but she back flies like this, and I can't seem to break the habit of trying to get her hands to be level, because she's really good with her right hand from playing badminton for years, but her left hand is a little bit lazy. So it's one of those things of like everyone, you see it through every walk of life. And then your endurance. If you come on a tunnel camp and you can't fly for an hour in the tunnel every day, or you can't do 10 jumps in a day and you start to get fatigued, then the fatigue limits your progression ability. So having more endurance for life will help you learn all day. The IBA. Yeah. Uh, they haven't had the best public relations in the last 12 months but it is something that I believe is helping our sport. All of the rules that are coming out are because of the ex extensive data that they've got for the near misses. And we all know that rules are written in blood. They're written. We start, we're doing this for 20 years now. It's starting to become a, a point of, they'll stop us completely because of the accidents that have gone wrong the same way British skydiving has put canopy rules in place, stickers in place. All of these rules are written for a reason. And so it's one of those points of just because our small world hasn't seen these accidents, I've seen a couple of them. And it's the reason why I coach how I coach is to stop people who are flying in a tube with 165 miles worth of wind with a glass wall next to them. So you, it's not if, it's when. You, when, you will hit the wall at some point, and you've got to make sure that all of your learning before that point is safe. The coaching courses that they do are amazing. 
if you're at that level and you want to get to the point of becoming your own FS coach, Fleur Jones is a perfect example. We worked together for ages of getting her to a skill level and then she went and did her coaching course and now she looks like a natural as she's teaching other new belly flies as she comes through. And so that's what you want to aspire to. You want to be able to look like you are quite comfortable walking and flying on your back and moving before you start trying to teach someone how to belly fly in a wind tunnel. And there's constant reviewing of coaches and the maintenance. All of the videos are recorded by iFly. That's how it works, right? And all of the trainers have access to all of the videos. So even my coaching, I have conversations with Josh, the head trainer in the UK, and we look at my coaching and we do different things, and it's one of those things of, it's their wind tunnel and I'm coaching in it. Even though I've been an instructor for years, there's always tips and points. He's like, oh, mate, I think this and I think this. And you go, oh, that's great. I'll just, we'll follow the wall and we'll follow along the bouncing ball and we'll keep everyone happy and safe. To tunnel or not to tunnel? If you think you're a purist and you're going to learn how to fly your body in the sky as a skydiver, it will just take you longer and you'll have some bad skills. This tool is just brought our level, our sport to the next level. It's not a thing of like, oh no, I shouldn't do it. It's like, no, you'll just be left behind. You can go from not being able to fly your body to be able to fly all the orientations in a couple of weeks. That's how quick tunnel flying can progress your flight system. How much money you spend in that couple of weeks is up to you but that's how it works. The tunnel camps, if you like immersed learning and you want it done in a week, come on a tunnel camp. It works out to be you are there with like-minded people and you get to spend a week learning a certain skill set and you're done. If you can't go away for a week and your family requirements are too much, then go to the local wind tunnel and do it in dribs and drabs as you progress along. It's whatever keeps the whole system moving along. And unlike skydiving where if four of you go for a jump, it still costs four jump tickets. As soon as you can start share and tunnel time, it becomes cheaper. So half as, as soon as you can share it with someone else, it's twice as cheap. Find your tribe. If you find that rookie team at the very beginning, and you work well as a team and you keep progressing, that'll move through into tracking, into free fly, in, in onto your head, all of the bits, going to boogies, going abroad. It keeps that small group mentality of what you know is safe and how you're going along. It'll be, that's what happens. It makes you stay in the sport. You will lose all your friends who don't skydive eventually, if you, how far you go in the world, because all your friends become skydivers. That's how it works. You'll have a couple of friends and family that stay around, but everyone just becomes a skydiving family. Do the scramble events, and you'll actually get to hang out with them off the drop zone at some point. It takes about two years. Have an experimental mindset not an expectation mindset. At no point do you ever feel like you can actually do it. It's always just you can do it slightly better. It's like fleeting moments of success that join together. You're always learning a new skill. Once you've learnt the skill and you can do it, you just start learning the next skill. So it never ends. So like, if you don't enjoy that learning process, you're not going to enjoy 90% of your progression because that's all it is. It's just constant learning. So enjoy the suck and the fleeting moments of like, oh, that was slightly better. Oh, that was slightly better. Excellent. Okay, cool. You just keep getting slightly better. There's no moment of like euphoria of like, oh, I get it all. It's amazing. It doesn't ever happen. Um, there is that point of, I think I'll never be able to do back fly, sit fly, take this dock. That does happen. The click will happen. There's that point where you go, oh, actually, I'm less stressed about this. I can do this skill. This is fine. 
It's the stressing on it that will kill the click because you're worried about it. Sensory overload is massive, especially guys for learning to fly head down. If you can't communicate or see past your own visor, you're never going to be able to feel how the wind is touching you. So be able to deal your, dial your whole life down to a four and be like, oh, this is okay, I can just calm, this is cool, I can feel this, is what helps you learn faster. Do your homework. I like students who ask me an in-depth question that they've read something somewhere, read an article, listened to something, because I do this for a living. So if you want to talk to me about back layouts or belly carving or something, then I'll geek out on that for an hour. Like, if you've got a good question or you want something super in-depth, then I can talk about it. But if I've got to tell you everything about it, then you'll only have my interpretation of what the knowledge I can give you. So the more you know, the better you can be to progress your skills. Do your own homework. Pick your end goal. If there's something that you like and you want to be able to do something, ask the coaches who are doing it everyone even to the top level if you sent Pete if you know because Pete Allen is a great canopy coach and he's a great um, belly coach as well if you want to compete at a world level in belly flying and you send Pete Allen a message he will answer it because that's how he that's what he does for a living so it's like you can ask it'd be like if we were a, wanted to contact a Formula One coach how to drive Formula One because that's what it is he's like yeah sure mate I'll answer this question same message add him on Facebook Talk to all your instructors and your coaches and people you respect in the sport. If they don't communicate with you, then they're not cooters. They're not at that point. So you can figure it out for yourself. If someone acts like that and you think it's acceptable, it's not. The more knowledge, the better questions. There's some quick research for your own guys. The IBA channel. The videos are very dry and American, but they're very clear. It's a great progression system. It's got enough to give you more questions to see where you can go to. So you, once you follow all the bouncing balls and they go, oh yeah, it's all very quite simple, then you can have better questions and more research into certain things that you like. So belly to back transitions. Mason Corby has an amazing uh, YouTube channel called Down Under Dynamics. He goes further into depth, past how far the IBA does, and so they've he they've they're forty minute long videos on how to sit fly, and it's like it's it's that's his enjoyment. And I've got some stretching videos that I find are very helpful, especially for everyone who's a bit stuck and a bit movement. These simple little videos are just exercises that will help you. Learn faster in a wind tunnel. Anything that you can do with your body outside the wind tunnel, you can do with it inside. So it's one of those things of if you get moving and movable outside, you'll only learn quicker on the inside. What's your plan for 2024? Set your goal and it'll help you focus on what you want to achieve. If you're broad and you want to achieve everything in this 12 months, that's not going to happen. Set small, simple goals and achieve them all year. And then you can set, because if you're going to be in the sport for two or three years, you can work your way through. What's your next step? Find yourself a coach, self, self, set yourself a budget, and then get at it. Done. Any questions? Yes, Lee. Hello. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do two. Um, first one is people who just tell you straight away in the tunnel, uh, I want to be head down. And it's Sean Brust. Sean, Sean Brust. That was me. Sean Brussels. Oh, Sean. Brussels. Sean, please, please report to reception. <laughs> Sean's not here, is he? Sean's not here. Okay. 
so, so can you please tell you straight away, I just want to do head down, I want to skip everything else. Uh, and then uh, your opinion about that, because you hear that a lot. Uh, and also, uh, you said about people who aren't used to, people here are all used to taking stickers and going BPA. Um, how bad is it with uh, people like from different countries who don't have stickers and then jumping straight away? Because there is a lot of peer pressure to jump with people straight away and for boogies and stuff that don't have stickers and there's that confidence level. Um, and there's the pressure to, to basically tell people to shut the fuck up and um, be quiet and just jump. Like, there's, there's, there's two very different issues. So to answer the first one, head down is the end goal. And so if the timeline and this is the end, to learn to fly your body will take that entire time. So you have to be able to understand where the wind comes from. You have to feel comfortable of going there. You have to get through all of the little hoops to be able to learn to feel comfortable on your head. Now, it'll still take this long. You can just learn all those bits while you're balancing on your head, and then you'll be terrible at all the other bits as it goes along, and you'll be able to balance on your head. Or you could be great on your belly to the point of it feels comfortable and moving. You can be great on your back. You can be great on your feet and sharing time. And then the learning curve of going, vert, uh, going inverted is a lot smaller. So the learning time while you're on your head is about a third because you've already built all the fundamentals of where the wind comes from, how it feels on your body, all of those bits. So flying on your head is the bit that's it's, it's quite easy to do, but if you can't do all the other bits, you're just going to spend all that time and money suffering through those bits. And it's sort of like, it's like for people in the industry of like, oh, it's great, you can fly on your head, but you can't do any all the other bits. You will finish that bit and then go back and then learn all the other bits repetitively again with bad habits because you rush through it. It's, it's like you're going to do it all, it's just a matter of when you get to it. So personally, it's one of those, I think you should learn to fly on your head. Second season, third season, after you can share head up and share, do all those other bits because then you've built the base to be able to do that. Does that answer that bit? And then without stickers, it puts more responsibility on the jump master and the load organizer and yourself. So the self-regulation, we were at Summerfest last year and there's no stickers and there's, it's a bit of a, it's not a free for all, but it's like, these are the skills you need to join this jump. Do you have them? This is how many people. And without the, I've got my sticker mentality, people go, that can't do that, can't do that. I can do that. And then the people that think that the people that are heading towards a danger zone are known on the, on the drop zone, and the load organizer goes, oh, mate, you should be down there doing that. So it's more self-regulated. That's not to say that the same way in the UK, people with stickers who shouldn't have them do jumps they shouldn't do, because that still happens, and we've got a stringent sticker system in place. So I, I believe both work. I'm a big fan of the self-regulations because skydiving is one of the most regulated sports. As soon as you start going speed flying or base jumping or any, in, into any of the really dangerous worlds, then it's completely unregulated. So and we all know what happens down that end. So it's that fine line between you need rules, but you also need great self-regulation. I felt safe with... Summerfest had 600, competitor, 600 people there, five planes running flat out, and there was one sprained ankle all week. So whatever they're doing works as well with no stickers. Right. So. So I had a question about sort of plateaus in, in flying. Um, maybe you can share some anecdotes sort of in your own progression about any plateaus and how you sort of overcome it. You know, if you're trying to learn a new skill, for example, you try, you know, you're struggling to sort of crack the skill. You know, do you move away from it? Try something else. Uh, maybe you can sort of talk about some of your own plateaus. 
I, uh, I've been really lucky. So when I was working in iFly Basenstoke, we had loads of international coaches coming through. And I always got coaching off everyone who I possibly could. Because I would find the coach that coached the skill that I wanted to learn. Or like I like coaching certain bits more than other bits. And so if someone said, what do you want to teach me? I'd be like, I'm going to teach you that move because I enjoy teaching that. I find if you want to learn the bit, if you want to fly the way you want to, go to that person and go, can you teach me how you do it like this? And then the, so broadening your knowledge and perspective on from different coaches is the perfect way to get through that next step. And then stressing less on the certain thing that you suck at. It's like a lot of the reason why you're not going any better is because you've like created this thing in your mind about what you think's going on. And so while you still have that same thought process of like, oh, I can't get any better at this or I, I can't achieve this, that's because you won't with a can't. Like it needs to be how do I fix it? Find the fixing. So take a step. Like if you hit the wall after a certain move, Hitting the wall is not the problem. The move's not done right. You need to look back two seconds before to find the problem, like have the mindset of opening the, this is the problem. You're like, no, the, this isn't, the, the problem's back here. Find it, find the problem, like, like self-evaluation, which is even harder, because you already think you can do the other skill better. So it's like, take one step back, turn the wind up, turn the wind down, fix the problem and spend more money. <laughs> Sacrifice more. Yeah, um, with using tunnel alongside skydiving, plane jumping, um, would it be, for example, if you went for back flying, would you do the tunnel time and then immediately go and do it in the sky? Or would you do progress all the way through the tunnel and then go and do it? So I'm, a, I'm a big believer of finish a skill. So like, if you can get in the tunnel and sit fly and take docks and turn and move and be happy to share with someone, then you can sort of sit fly. Then take that skill to the sky because you know the balancing, you know the different wind speeds, you know, like you, if you can ride the bike, it's fine. You could get on numerous different bikes and still be able to ride, does that make sense? I'm getting a, a finishing signal. Is the AGM? I think the AGM thing on. Does that make sense? Yes. So finish the skill and then take that to the sky. Is it quick, Andy? Yeah. In your professional uh, opinion, both a, uh, a highly experienced tunnel instructor, load organizer, and mentor, um, the gentleman that you used inside the Control Your Ego um, slide, um, would you say that he has a problem with his ego? I don't know who he is. I wouldn't say his ego, it's his personality that needs working on. <laughs> Is that good enough? Yeah, Rob and I have been friends for years. It's a long-running joke. And I did it because he was here. Right. Is everyone else happy? I think we've got the... Done. Stress over. Let's go drink beer.